century were eager to move into the west, the area between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River. Their eagerness caused them to despair rather quickly of traveling along sunken ruts that passed as roads. Fortunately, the problem was partially solved by improvements in road building and the development of the steam locomotive. been roads, often old Indian trails called traces. This is the Natchez Trace, a link from the Mississippi River to Nashville, Tennessee. Many of these routes hardly deserve the name road. Besides the danger of being robbed, a traveler, particularly in the rainy season, had to contend with ruts and mud holes that made travel virtually impossible. The Western Movement created a need for better transportation. Obviously, people in the West wanted to sell their goods somewhere, presumably in the East. They needed to buy manufactured goods from the East and move those to the West. So that was one reason for better transportation. Another was the matter of national unity. The people across the mountains were separated from the rest of the country. There actually was a fear that they might break away and start a whole new country of their own. So the government was interested in connecting that area to the East to bind the nation together. Now, one way to do that was to build roads. <laughs> Nearly everybody agreed that roads needed to be improved. What they couldn't agree on is who ought to pay for it. If a road went from one state to another, should the national government pay for that, or should the state governments? That's what they argued about. While they were arguing, private companies built roads. Private companies? We wouldn't think of that today. A private company building a road across the country and charging you to travel on it? They wouldn't make any money that way. They didn't make a lot in those days. Maybe 3% return on their investment. But they tried. They put a post here and another post over there, put a log across it, a pointed log called a pike. You would come along, pay your toll, and they would turn the pike out of the way. That's where we get the term turnpikes. They'd build a toll house right there. Somebody would live there, and they'd watch for travelers and charge them. The national government did build one road in the early 19th century, called it the National Road. Sometimes it's called the Cumberland Road. You can still travel on it. Lots of people still do. They don't always know it. It's now US 40 in Pennsylvania, or in some sections, it's I-70. But along US 40, you'll still see those old toll houses that were part of the old National Road. It went from the East Coast to the Ohio Valley, actually from Cumberland, Maryland, to Wheeling, West Virginia. That's why sometimes it's called the Cumberland Road. It was extended onto Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. It cost them about $13,000 a mile to build it. In some sections, it was 80 feet wide. They wanted it wide enough that a wagon and a team of horses could turn around in the middle of it. The National Road was very busy maybe as many as 2,000 vehicles a month going along it. And because it was busy, they needed places for people to stop, to sleep, and to eat. Between Baltimore, Maryland, and Wheeling, West Virginia, there were as many as 294 inns. Now, most of them were not as elegant as the Mount Washington Tavern here. You could sleep in these places for about 35 cents a night, probably on the floor. But before you slept, well, there were other things to do. There was always drinking. Their business was both beds and booze. In fact, one man said that his job as an innkeeper was to water the horses and brandy the men. You could play cards. No kings or queens or jacks on these. You have presidents, famous women, Indians maybe. We don't want royalty. You could play checkers. 
the pieces were sliced up corn cobs. You could sit around, smoke your pipe, generally enjoy yourself. Well, where are all these people going? Well, 80% of them were going to the Ohio River Valley. They were settlers moving to the West. And because they moved to the West, they had to make a living out there. They had to ship their goods to the East. So as you're going West in your stagecoach, maybe at six to 10 miles an hour, you're going to encounter herds of cattle, pigs, flocks of turkeys being driven back to the East. So the road is congested, it's crowded. You were never out of sight of a traveler on the National Road. Octogenarians who participated in the traffic will tell you that never before were there such landlords, such taverns, such dinners, such whiskey, or such an endless cavalcade of coaches and wagons. The wagons he's referring to were Conestoga wagons. When you think covered wagon, you think Conestoga wagon. Curved up at the ends, often painted blue. Because the drivers of those things often smoked cigars, cigars took the nickname of Stogies, a name that has stuck to this day. Conestoga comes from a valley in Pennsylvania where the wagons were developed. Well, the National Road and other Western roads will fall into decline. They'll come back again when the automobile shows up. But the railroad will replace them. The railroad was faster and smoother. It had replaced canals. It had replaced steamboats to a certain degree. And it'll replace the roads. But in its heyday, the National Road, the Cumberland Road, the Old Pike, whatever you want to call it, was a highway of hope to thousands and thousands was the highway of hope, and the pilgrims who trod it were lords of the woodland and sons of the sod. And the hope of their hearts was to win an abode at the end, the far end of the National Road. The development of the railroad shows the connection between the Industrial Revolution and transportation, the taking of a steam engine and putting it into a railroad locomotive. Now, they had used rails for a long time. They mounted stagecoaches on these things, had horses pull them. That was a smoother ride. That worked pretty well. But the real breakthrough came with putting a steam engine in a locomotive. Now, the first locomotive built in the United States for regular service was the best friend, or the best friend of Charleston. They ran it on Christmas Day, 1830. 141 passengers flat cars with cannon on there, booming along as they went. 136 miles long. That made it the longest railroad in the whole world. People were fascinated by these things. Even Henry David Thoreau thought at last the earth had a race worthy to inhabit it. And Emily Dickinson, isolated, crouching in her woods, wrote, I'd like to see it lap the miles and lick the valleys up. It was the first big business in the country. Erie Railroad cost $23 million to build. Nobody had thought of spending that type of money for a single business. By 1850, 30,000 miles of railroad in the United States. The poor animals, they didn't know what to make of it. Farmers complained that their chickens wouldn't lay eggs and cows wouldn't give milk. Well, you understand why. Imagine yourself a good, quiet, peaceful, self-respecting cow, and along comes this thing, hell in harness, blazing through your pasture, snorting fire. No wonder they didn't like it. But people did. One passenger described a railroad like this. Just imagine such a contraption rushing unexpectedly by a stranger on a dark night. Whizzing and rattling and panting, its fiery furnace gleaming, its chimney vomiting smoke, its body of cars like the tail of a giant dragon. Well, what was travel like for the passengers? Well, there wasn't a whole lot that a modern traveler would enjoy. For one thing, they burned wood. When you take a wood fire and you have a high wind, as you would get with the train moving along, you get cinders blowing around. The sides of the cars are usually open. It would come sailing in here, land on your lap, set you on fire. Sometimes large chunks of wood would do that. There was always a danger of an explosion. Occasionally, you found a train with a barrier car, a flat car between the engine and the passengers here with bales of cotton on it. Protect them in case of an explosion. 
accidents were a problem. Look at the pictures in any magazine at the time. It's full of railroad accidents. They seem to be obsessed with it. The invention of the telegraph helped out a lot. They say that necessity is the mud of invention. It was necessary to send a message ahead when the train was coming. So Samuel Morse developed the telegraph. It was almost immediately put into use by the railroads. Early cars were connected with chains, just hanging slack. When the engine started up, pow, jerk, jerk, jerk right down the line. When they stopped, they all slammed together. Fairly early, they developed a system to get around that problem, at least. But to many people, it was exciting. Going along, being set on fire, your head being snapped around. They said, isn't science wonderful, as they went tearing across the countryside. To most of us, the ride was sublime, was exciting, even though the sparks of the locomotive flew over us in a perpetual shower, often burning holes in our clothes. A lot of people weren't sure the train was here to stay. Surely the horse was superior. There was a famous race, incidentally, between a horse and a railroad engine, the Tom Thumb. The horse won that, probably the last time a horse beat a locomotive. There was opposition from drivers of wagon trains and canal owners. They didn't like the new railroad, used to shoot at them as they went by. A lot of doctors said the trains were injurious to your health. The human body couldn't stand the high speed. It would suck the air out of your lungs, they'd collapse. People used to carry a pen and pencil with them, and as they went sailing along at 20 miles an hour, they would write their name to show that they still had their wits about them. When they developed tunnels, well, that was impossible. Obviously, you'll be suffocated in there. The train will come out one long, snake-like coffin. In spite of all this, people decided trains were going to be around a while. Improvements began to take place. They certainly began to look a lot better. Really elaborate coaches. Somebody said an engine ought to look better than a pot-bellied stove on a flat car. The majority of railroads were built in the north and tended to connect the northeast with the west. Very few lines ran north and south. It had been hoped that the new developments in transportation would unite the nation. That worked out as far as the West was concerned, but not for the South. When we get to the Civil War, it will be the North and the Northwest united against the South. And the fact that these transportation routes ran that way had a great deal to do with that. Today it's kind of hard to imagine the feeling that people had towards steam and steam locomotives. They were fascinated by them. When you grew up, you wanted to be an engineer. Other jobs might pay better. You didn't care. This was exciting. He was a hero. Girls would sing about a railroader for me. Mm -hmm. 